our goal in what we do is to make sure consumers have the correct information about their food to make informed decisions and confident decisions about their food. We don't pick sides. We don't pick chicken over beef over pork. Um, it's completely up to consumers what they want. We just want to make sure that they have the complete information about what they're eating to make an informed decision. Now, I want to talk about my own farm, and this is uh, the reason why uh, Canada Beef wanted me to come in here, is, is speak a little bit more about sustainability and actually have a face to the word sustainability in our own farms. So this is my family, uh, my wife and two kids, as mentioned. Uh, we have three different aspects to our farms. The first one is uh, a grain farm. The other thing that was mentioned, we were part of a, a young farmer program. I know I'm bald, um, I'm not very young, but I was still considered young in the young farmer program. Uh, we ended up getting into the layer business. Now the layer business is uh, eggs. What? Yeah, who would have thought? Yeah, layers are eggs. So uh, we have uh, 8,500 young ladies that, that lay, we try and get them to lay an egg a day. Uh, we're at about 97.5% uh, of lay on our, our, our family farm. The other thing too, and, and this is my son when he was uh, a little bit younger, um, I married into an Oklahoma ranching family uh, down close to the Texas border. Uh, my father-in-law put a lot of effort into genetics with black Angus cattle. He's done a very good job of increasing the genetics on his own herd in Oklahoma and as a result has some of the top genetics now in North America. Uh, and I've trucked cattle from uh, Texas to uh, Missouri as well to uh, drop off animals and something that we're definitely very proud of and, and something that we're looking at upgrading all the time the genetics to make sure it's sustainable and what consumers want. Now, and this is where there's a, a, a visual difference between the old McDonald farm and what really is happening in terms of sustainability. And I get this a lot. Marilyn's comment about asking people on the street, it is extremely true about what people think is sustainable. If you have a couple of pigs, a couple of chickens, a few rows of corn, how many people are you gonna feed? Probably not a lot, right? Sustainability on our farm, and I'm not a lot different than any other farmer here in North America, looks like the picture on your right. That's the inside of my tractor that I plant with. And I'm gonna go through a little bit of this in a video, hopefully the sound comes through on it, but to explain a lot of what we do in precision agriculture to make sure we're actually putting what's needed where it's needed. And you can't do that if you have 40 acres of land. The, the, the price of this stuff just won't compute. So in order to have that technology, we have to be large enough to actually afford to use it. And then we have to have all the, the other individuals in the system. It's not just my brother, my dad, myself that do this. It's, it's wide scale, it's using information from our banker, from the soil scientist, from the individuals who are trying to look at the University of Saskatchewan on different products or different diseases that are coming up. So when I look at sustainability, I look at a long-term multi-generational plan. Now the thing is, people reminisce about the old times and how they were awesome. Turns out they really weren't that awesome when you start talking to some of the older fellas or older ladies in, the, in the, the crowd who had to do a lot of that. That's the reason why we moved to this new technology. Show of hands, how many people still drive a 1960s vehicle because they love the efficiency of it? <laughs> exactly. No different than farmers, right? We've adopted new technologies and new ways to grow crops. And effectively, what we want to do is make sure that our land, our business plan, everything else is sustainable so that in the future, my daughter, my son, my nieces can take over that family farm. If I could just sum it up, it's ensuring we're putting what we need where we need it. That's what it is. And we're using technology to do it. Dirt is the lifeblood of every farm or ranch here in this country. Anything we can do to make it better, we're gonna do. And this has a variety of different ways 
going about it. And this is hard to see the numbers, but we actually pay a lot of money to a soil scientist to actually go out on each parcel of our land to figure out what nutrients that soil needs for the crop that we're growing. And I have the ability, and I'll show you the video right after this, of how to actually go in and adjust for each of those fields. Go ahead. So I uh, thought I'd kind of explain the whole seeding system. It's uh, quite a long unit that we have here. So this right here, uh, that's our anhydrous tank. So that's uh, um, where we get our nitrogen. I'll show you where that goes. We have seed place fertilizer in here, as well as uh, seed. Um, right now I'm seeding malting barley for beer. Uh, and we have a whole bunch of different gauges that uh, we calibrate to make sure we're getting the right amount of seed and fertilizer uh, that's based on a soil scientist's uh, recommendation uh, that we uh, pay for. So what happens is the, uh, the cart over here is pressurized with air. There's a big fan uh, and that then seeds out the fertilizer uh, through these tubes and the seed and it goes all the way through these big hoses and all these little hoses and eventually gets into um, the furrows. So these are, this is what we call a precision uh, seeding system or a precision drill. So if you look right here, um, you can see there's uh, barley seed right here. And you can see there's moisture pretty much uh, just a little bit below the uh, surface. It's kind of, you can see it's dusty, dusty right here, but you don't have to dig very far and then you can see the, the moist dirt and that's exactly where we want uh, to put the seed. And then uh, you can see that's my uh, big old tractor um, that pulls it all. But you can see I have numerous different things from my hydraulic controls. This right here is the monitor to set the pressure on those independent packers. This is a blockage monitor, so it tells me if any of my little tubes are plugged up with seed or something else, gook. This is kind of the main system that runs my auto steer. Uh, as I mentioned before, the anhydrous actually goes through discs on the front, which I'll just show you in a bit. This is my monitor to sh show how much I'm seeding. And this will actually automatically turn on and turn off. Uh, if I'm overlapping for any reason, it automatically shuts off. Uh, and I can set uh, how many pounds of nitrogen I want as per the soil scientist's recommendation. It goes into these little discs. So they're fine discs right here. And there's hoses on the back right here where the anhydrous shoots down into the ground. So we try not to lose any uh, nitrogen to the environment. Try to be as environmentally con conscious as possible conscience as possible. Okay, and that's kind of a quick overview of uh, how a cedar works. So the uh, uh, picture on the left is actually, I can take off my phone. That's the inside of my barn, monitoring all the sensors, monitoring what's happening in my barn from the static pressure to the temperature water, feed consumption. If for any reason something happens in that barn, that feed consumption, water consumption goes down, I get a call. It goes right to my phone. Power goes off, get a call. We monitor it like a hawk. Similar on the other side, the EPDs. So this is the estimated progeny of the, the cattle industry. And you can see how we've changed in our genetics to make sure we're actually growing what consumers want. They want bigger ribeyes. We've increased them. That's an effort in sustainability with our cattle herd as well. So this is another, I, I sometimes get a lot of comments around feedlots. Has anybody been to a feedlot in the room? Oh, so a lot of you have. So th this feedlot in particular, I actually sit on the board of directors for, so it's a local uh, feedlot close to our place. One of the big things, there's two big things that I, I like as take home messages for feedlots. One is this last year, and I was talking to the, the Ontario grain farmers over there before, we didn't have a really good harvest season for our barley and our wheat. 
We have two options when that happens. If it does not make human grade consumption, it has to go into the feed market. If the feed market wasn't there, I'm now contributing to food waste and I'm dumping it in the bush. Because I have a market for that and it can go into livestock production, now I have a place to actually put that grain and turn something that humans can't use into actual animal protein. The other thing is, on this feedlot, and, and there's about 35,000 head of cattle in this feedlot, there are cowboys and cowgirls that go through those ranches pretty much every hour to make sure those animals are healthy. If there is any sick animal, they actually have their own designated hospital to take them into. And it's amazing to see the care that they can give because they do have the employees to do it. The other thing, like I mentioned, is, is uh, market risk. Um, I, I just want to bring this up because there's a lot of things that, that affect sustainability that are really out of our hands. This. My brother and I were talking this last August about Twitter insurance and how we needed to buy Twitter insurance on American presidents <laughs> and Canadian prime ministers for that matter. Here is a great example of something completely out of our control. Tweet goes out, market collapses. That day that that tweet went out saying that there was going to be more tariffs put on Chinese products and then the issues we're having with China with canola right now had the effect of, of putting down our markets to the point where we're no longer profitable on canola if we were to sell on that day. And we do everything possible to maximize and forward contract on Chicago to make sure that we can get levels of profitability in there. But when the markets are continually going down because of political reasons, we have no control over that whatsoever. So that affects things. So just in final, uh, if you can take anything away from this, is, is turns out we're people too. We're no different than urbanites in terms of what we look like other than our belt buckles and cowboy boots, some of us. But we also eat what we produce. When I harvest my flax, my peas, that I use a desiccant on to dry them out, I will go in the back of the combine, pull a bucket of those out, and I will feed them to my little girl and little boy. Because I trust what I do on my farm and I have pride in what I produce. Similarly, we'll go into the cooler in our egg barn and pick up eggs. What we grow, we eat as well. And the other thing, we want to make sure that land is in better shape. Just like my grandpa left to my dad, and my dad left to me, I want to leave it to my family in better shape than when I got it. 